in this episode of the Connor Carrick Podcast. You know, Connor, I really think everyone's excellent at something, and you're really lucky if you find it. And the day I went down to the Argonaut Rowing Club uh, was one of the luckiest days in my life. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Connor Carrick Podcast. I'm your host, current New Jersey Devils defenseman, Connor Carrick. Thank you for joining me and my guest today, Marnie McBean, from wherever you are in the world today. Uh, she is an excellent orator, first off. Um, she does speak uh, professionally now and mentor uh, with Team Canada, uh, and she is well qualified for the position to do so, as she has uh, four medals, four Olympic medals to her name, three golds. Uh, she was an Olympic rower at the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona uh, and also in the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Uh, we talk a little bit about her experience with injury at the 2000 Olympics in Sydney as she could not uh, row and had to uh, go into retirement with surgery. She is an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, she is in the Canadian Olympic Hall of Fame and she is also in the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. She is a recipient of the Governor General's Meritorious Service. Uh, medal and the Queen's Diamond Jub Jubilee Medal. Uh, she is also uh, was named prior to the postponement of the Tokyo uh, 2020 Chef de Michonne, that's how she said it in the podcast, uh, for Team Canada, which is sort of their team leader uh, and official mentor. Uh, she's an exceptional leader. Uh, rowing is, as we will learn today, uh, a total beast of a sport. Uh, and I'm really excited to share this podcast with you. Marty is an exceptional individual, um, and uh, I had a great time getting to know her, and I know you will too. Thank you for joining us. Marnie, I wanted to say thanks first. We'll jump right into it. But, um, you know, I think it's always cool to speak to athletes from different disciplines, uh, speak to athletes of, from different disciplines that are fantastic and world-class at what they do. And, um, you know, I was reading up on, you know, your experiences with the 92 and the 96, you know, Olympics. Uh, I was reading up on, you know, your start uh, in rowing. And I think that's where I would like to start today because my whole lane on the podcast is the curious competitor. So my goal is to, um, help empower our listener with some, the, the ability to curate their own habits. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think rowing just given the extremely physical nature of the sport, like I'm very curious, I was reading up on the story about how you were 16 on your website, watching the LA Olympics and kind of discussing you know, what a party this was to see. How can I, how can I get to the dance? Yeah. And you end up in the world of rowing. Um, and I'll turn it over to you there because I think it's a fascinating start to your sport. Yeah, well, I, it's, it's, you know, it's a funny thing because I saw those, uh, the LA Olympics and um, I was really a jock of all sports. I did everything. Although I will say I, I have never played hockey. My brother just used to put me in net and fire the ball at me until I went home crying. So it was, <laughs> that wasn't a, that wasn't right a happy sport it, yeah. for me. No, it wasn't a good sport for me. And um, luckily way more girls um, are, are streaming into the sport. That wasn't the case when, and I, I didn't, wasn't really keen on ring it. But anyways, so I did lots of sports and I saw the LA Olympics and, you know, the, the, the sports were amazing, but it was that party, the closing ceremony party with all the athletes. I'm like, oh my God, I want to go to a party like that. I'm only 16. I still wanted to go to a party like that. <laughs> and, um, you know, in the next year there was, uh, it was a chocolate bar commercial and it was the, a coffee crisp commercial. Um, I don't even know in the States if you even know what a coffee crisp is. Um, but, you know, it tastes like coffee and it's crispy. Um, and I don't even like it, but it was a, f it had rowing in it. And they took the Queen song and they, they played another one bites the dust and turned it into another one bites the crisp. And there was, so there was rowing. And then uh, shortly after that, there was also um, the movie Oxford Blues, which had Rob Lowe rowing around a pair of jeans, which now I know is ridiculous, but um, <laughs> it was Rob Ro Lowe rowing around in a pair of jeans. And I, I left that movie and I thought, God, that, that sport looked amazing. And like, I, I want to do that. And I went home and I asked my mom, like, how do you learn to row? And she's like, I don't know. Like, who knows anything about rowing? Like, really, I, I had a cousin in Vancouver, which is very far from where I grew up in Toronto, who I knew he rowed, but that still doesn't give me any entry access. 
And so um, it, dating myself right here, I, I pulled out the phone book and I looked up the, um, the Argonaut. And kids are like, the what? I mean, it's like, it's Google. Um, but I, I pulled out the phone Just book. Google and I phone looked book, up a, kids. <laughs> right? Like, you know, you want a phone number? Like, there's no websites. And uh, somebody answered the phone. And when I said, how do you learn to row? And they said, there's a learn to row program. And I went down and, um, you know, Connor, I really think everyone's excellent at something. And you're really lucky if you find it. And the day I went down to the Argonaut Rowing Club uh, was one of the luckiest days in my life. That's, I mean... You know, for one, on the movie with Rob Lowe, that's like when I was in school and everyone asked me if hockey's really like the Mighty Ducks. And I'm like, <laughs> no, we're not doing the flying V behind the net. That's not hockey. Um, at least not, you know, at the levels or, or wherever I played. But, I mean, that's that's such an interesting, you know, I saw, so I started hockey at like four or five. I never really had a choice. I, I didn't totally um, love the sport at first because my feet hurt all the time. I had skates that were too narrow, but my dad, we just you, had a conversation. Do you feel that way? You didn't have a choice. My dad said, we will finish what you started. Mm -hmm. And in the meanwhile, he started to work on wider skates. So like all my earliest memories, my dad would put me on top of the net and be retying my skates because they, they yeah. my feet hurt so bad. And eventually I ended up, you know, really loving it. So I, I never really made... I guess a, a conscious decision to go, that was super cool. I want to do that. When I started to get really serious at nine, 10, even more so at 13, 15, I was, you know, head over heels for the game. Um, but so after, after that phone call, you, what, do, how did you get good at rowing? Like what was the process and what did you start to do from, you obviously had a good athletic background, which I'm sure lended itself well to, you know, a, a sport yeah. so physically driven. Um, but what really, you know, got you into it and got you going? And then, you know, when was kind of the first moment you really realized you were getting good at this? Um, well, I, so I signed up for a Learn to Row program and it was like Saturdays and Sundays for two hours. And um, I was actually doing it after swimming. So I was, I don't know, taking my bronze cross or something like that for two hours. Then I'd get on my bike and I'd ride down to the rowing club. And in hindsight, it's like the worst thing you could do when you're going to go rowing. Like if you, if you know anybody who rows, they usually have mashed up hands. And so the worst thing you want to do before you go rowing is put your hands in a pool um, for two hours and get them all nice and soft. Um, but th I had a natural, it, like, you know, it sounds like I'm, I'm blowing smoke, but um, I had water feel. And so from the very first time, like I was, I didn't know what I was doing, but um, I knew when I put the blade in the water, how to make it feel like my blade was was connecting with the water. And when your blade connects, you, you lift up, you rise cause you're lifting the boat up as you, mm -hmm. as you go. And, and so I, I had water, water feel. And, um, it's, it's funny because, so I took learn to row. And in that first summer I rode just club, like you know, just club for the Argonaut rowing club. And there's this one woman there. Um, her name's Patty Young, but we all called her Patty Paddle. And, she, she said to me after I finished Learn to Row, she's like, you're, you're going to go far in this sport, right? And I'm like, at this point, I'm 17 now. And I'm like, that's awesome. Someone said, I'm going to go far in this sport. Um, and that St. Patty uh, wrote for a swimming journal at the Barcelona Olympics. And she came up to me the, uh, in Barcelona, like I'm, I'm jumping like way ahead, but she's like, do you remember? I'm like, I totally remember. And, and she, she saw it. Like she saw something, you know, in my first eight weeks of rowing. Um, but that said, and now I'm kind of going all over the place. So I, I rode club. Um, and at the end of that year, like that was great. I just went back to my high school. My high school didn't have any rowing. So I was like doing a million sports that I was competitive at because I, I, I was driven and I was aggressive. Um, like, but I, I wasn't really talented. I don't, I don't possess agility. I don't have hand-eye coordination. I, I can't follow a ball. Um, I'm more of, I'm more likely to be, um, assisting than scoring kind of thing. But, um, that winter, somebody I met called me up and said, are you going to try out for the junior national team? And, and I was like, what's the junior national team? And they said, oh, you have to do an erg. I'm like, what's an erg? And I, you know, one of the, the threads to, I think my success is sometimes I was just too naive to know, that I was underprepared for the next step. Um, and so when someone said, are you going to do this? I would always just say yes. And then, well, how am I supposed to do that? 
And, you know, <laughs> I, I would go and I would do this ERG test and um, it turned out that and it's a rowing machine and, and I did the ERG test and it turned out that um, with under a year of rowing, I submitted the highest junior score in the country, but I had no idea. Like I had no oh. idea. I, I thought maybe I had a, a pretty average score because um, they didn't post the scores. I thought, oh, that's going to be average. And I kept showing up and thinking, well, I better get a better test the next time. Um, and it got to a point where I was doing in um, six minutes what some of the senior rowers were doing in a seven-minute test. Um, I was just um, I was, I was just really strong. And so I made the junior national team. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of hindsight filling out of this story. But so I, I made the junior national team. And the poor girl, and I was, I was rowing in a pair, which meant, I, and there I was rowing port side. So I was, I had one oar and I went out one side of the boat and I was rowing with a starboard side rower and, and Julie went out the starboard side of the boat, the left side of the boat. We go backwards. Um, but uh, <laughs> poor Julie, she was like forced back. She'd been rowing for five years and she got put back in to learn to row because they had to teach me how to row. Um, we went to the junior worlds and, and again, I'm jumping ahead, but we went to the junior worlds that year and we got a bronze medal. And the coach later told me that in selection, they had never seen anybody go so fast and look so bad. So, um, you know, as <laughs> somewhere there as is much, a really high backhand right, compliment. Yeah. As, as, right. As, as much as I had water feel, I didn't know what to do with it. Um, mm. and so I was always really lucky that, um, I came, um, I was always introduced to good coaches, um, who could help me to the, ne the next step. And I, I just, for the longest time, I remained na too naive to know that I was underprepared for the next step that I was trying for. I love the bit where you're talking about the, the hands, you know, of rowers having the tough hands. Like I love um, sort of like the calluses and scars of different sports and how they show up. Like in hockey, a lot of times, you know, we all shoot one side, our posture's kind of jacked up and our mm -hmm. feet from being crammed in these skates. I think that's super cool. But like when you're doing an erg like that, I guess, so what I, what I think of is in hockey, I am, there's so many different elements, right? Like um, there's, a, there's a quarterback element in which I'm trying to make plays and I'm trying to see lanes on the ice and I get to have the puck and, you know, pass it to somebody else, like a quarterback would. You know, there's elements where I'm trying to dart through players. You know, you're, you're like a, a running back. There's times where you're like a linebacker, you get to hit somebody. There's these different sport elements that, and I used all football analogies, which was poor, but you know, there's these different elements of the sport that keep it interesting and different. I always have tremendous respect for sports that the simple goal is to continue to get better at the one task. So with rowing, mm -hmm. the goal every single day is just to become faster than the day before. Yeah. And I just think the highly exhaustive nature of your sport, like I, our punishment in our sport where we get to go on the goal line and skate till we get exhausted is, is your entire sport. And I have tremendous ref respect for yeah, yeah. like the physical toll that that must leave. Like, what does that feel like after an erg test? Because I'm, it's gotta be, I imagine it's exhaust, exhaustive, but I don't know. I've never, I've never wrote. Yeah. Well, er, er, <laughs> There's, there's a whole conversation there between the difference of um, your type of team sport and my type of team sport. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we could get back to chaos versus non-chaos sports. But um, yeah, er erg tests, uh, you're accountable to yourself. Like you're 100% accountable to your test. There's no teammate. We like a rower. We, we never make eye contact. You can never, there's no talking to each other in the boat. Like, come on, you can do this. Um, so an, an erg test is like, as much um, uh, mental your your mental accountability yourself as anything else. Uh, I I know I actually have a um, a friend who he's he's a five time Olympic champion. He won at five consecutive games like eighty four, eighty eight, ninety two, ninety six, two thousand in rowing. So power endurance sport, and um, he's really shitty on the erg. And it's wow. like you put him in a boat with other people. And he's like, literally, he wrote the book. He's extraordinary. Um, but he he can't row a single. Um, he tried. He can't be in a boat by himself and be competitive at that level. And I've, I, I have even seen him in, in a competition on an erg stop, which is, you don't do that. Um, not, not when you get to the level that he was at, but that... It, it was something in his brain where it's, it's a lot easier in an, in an erg 
if you stop, you're letting yourself down, right? But, you know, on, on your team, if you stop, you're letting your teammates down. And there's, there's something completely different there. And, and when we row in our crew boats, we have that accountability to each other. Um, and, and like you said, it's a, it's an individual task, but, um, we don't, we don't, I, I'm, I've, I've come in, in all the mentoring that I do when I'm talking to other athletes to, to realize there are two types of team sports, like, and, and yours, you know, ho- hockey, football, anything where there is an offense and defense is a, a chaos sport. And, and I'm from an, there's no chaos in, in my event. Like I, I'm going to be in a crew. I know it's 2000 meters. There's six lanes. No one's coming into my lane. No one's getting in the way. Um, if there's a wind, it's probably going to hit all of us equally. And we just put our head down and, and grind for six to nine minutes. So it depends on the wind. But And you were talking about, I was reading up on your website about um, your first big win, sort of the rowing Wimbledon. And am I saying this right? Lucerne, Switzerland? Yeah. Yep. And you're discussing again, maybe that naivety where you kind of did not know just maybe what you were next. I wonder if that's, you know, still a part of your career at this point. Um, but the night before with your partner, uh, Kathleen Heddle, you discussed, and this, you know, we can touch on, you know, some of the mentoring you do now and how you've borrowed from your rowing excellence to build and, and help athletes, um, you know, now with what you're doing, but you discussed being scared the night before with your partner. Yeah. And just, I think in a lot of what I was, you know, listening, you speak, um, in other, you know, speeches you've done, you talk about having an acceptance with that fear that I think is really admirable, um, and very respectful of the process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're really well researched, Connor. That's kind of scaring me, but, um, I was in uh, a phone book as I just checked the- Yeah. <laughs> that Google thing, that, that, that Google thing. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, so, so, you know, we, we were Canadian rowers and no one expected Canadians come along and, and it might, we might as well have been Swiss hockey players at the time, right? Like it just, we spoke English. So the, the Russians, Romanians, uh, at the time it was the East Germans and the West Germans, the Bulgarians. Uh, Those were the superpowers in, in our sport. We spoke English. We were part of the Commonwealth. They just, nobody cared about us at all. And we showed up and we had trained so hard um, that winter and that spring we showed up and we were just going faster than everybody. And we got to the, the Lucerne world cup, which as you said, is we do, we do consider it. It's like our, our top world cup. It's our Wimbledon. It's a, it's a glorious place to row. It's beautiful and it's fast and, um, and it's, it runs on Swiss timing. So it's, 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 it's like a Mecca for us to be able to, to row there. And we showed up going fast and in a, a semifinal, we beat everybody. We beat everyone who had won, um, at the world championships last year. I think it was the, the worst seeded semifinal ever, because I think we had first, second, fourth, fifth, um, from last year's world championship final, like, so we, and we won that race easily. And as wow. we were walking around the rest of the day, um, people were, were talking about us and, and people were talking to our coaches to just about how well we rode that. You know, I went from being this, this athlete, you know, like I, I, I said already, this athlete who was going so fast, but looked so bad. I, I didn't like that. So, you know, I had spent the last, you know, f- previous five years, just working on technique. And Kathleen is just a beautiful rower. She's got beautiful rhythm. Um, so with a combination of our, our heightened level of technique and her rhythm, we were flying by everyone. And so everyone like he was anointing us and going to bed that night, we had this, this pressure, these expectations on us. And, and, you know, you would remember this from when you, you shared rooms with a teammate, like, you're lying there and, and you're it's in the darkness. You, you can kind of, you can go one way or the other. You can expose your vulnerabilities or you don't. And, um, I, I don't have an internal dialogue. So I just said to Kathleen, I'm like, everyone thinks we're going to win this tomorrow. And she's, she's an introvert. She's very quiet. So eventually she just sort of said, I know. And I was like, 
I'm really scared, right? Like that, that was expectations scared me. I said, I'm really scared. And, uh, she just said very quietly and eventually she just said me too. And I thought, oh, well, if she's, if she's scared, then I don't need to worry about being scared. And it, it was a funny thing because it wasn't that I was like, if she's scared, I don't need to be scared. It was, I don't need to worry about being afraid. I was like, oh, that's okay. And I think that's one of the biggest things when I, when I talk to other athletes, like if you have fear and doubt, um, it doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. If, if you have fear and doubt, if, if you're worried about whether or not you can complete what you want to do, if you can step up, like it doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. It actually means you're on the right path. You know, and, and there's all the, the cliches that go with it. Like there, there is no courage without fear. Anyone who has fear, like anyone who you think has been courageous has come through something that was scary. Like that's, that's why it's courageous. They had courage. And, and I think, um, you know, Alex Bilodeau, who was the, the Canadian who got the first gold medal after in our third Olympics of hosting, right? We hosted in Montreal and, and Calgary and, and then in Vancouver, um, Alex Bilodeau was the first Canadian to win a gold medal. And he was asked about um, if he was scared when he was at the top of the hill, he was a, a moguls skier. And, and he said, as, as soon as you put, um, as soon as you care about something, you, you will be stressed about it. And, and I think that's the thing that, that I carry forward from that, that moment, that conversation with Kathleen, because the next day, you know, it's, my fear didn't go away. I just kind of tried to turn the volume down on it. Like you don't make stress go away. You don't make your fears and doubts go away. You, you just try and turn the volume down and then you, you focus on something that you can focus on. So I would focus on technique, right? Instead of focusing on the finish line, I would focus on my first four strokes, and then when I was done those four strokes, my next five strokes, and then there was another five and then 10, and then there was 25 strokes. And now I'm at the 250 and the 250, 250 meter mark, I got something to think about. And so just would really come up with a detailed race plan. And anytime I got uh, full of fear and doubts, I'm like, what is my next step? And I do that to this day. Like, you know, uh, I don't think about, I know where I'm going. Like I need to know what my destination is and what my goal is. Um, but then I need to let go of that and I, I need to look at where my feet are right now and what's my next step, because that's the thing that doesn't scare me so much is, and it does sometimes like the first step is sometimes hard, but the second step is momentum. And, you know, you just kind of try and ride the volume control of, you know, fear and doubt. And then the, the technical preparedness and readiness and why not me? Yeah, I, I I love that because if that's something that I look back over my career, you know, I remember my first NHL game. I was playing the Chicago Blackhawks. I made uh, the Washington Capitals at 19. I wasn't expected to make the club. I make the club. It was kind of the Cinderella story. I, I was super excited and couldn't believe I was playing against my hometown team. It's where I grew up. And to boot, they were raising the Stanley Cup banner that night because they had, won, they had won the year before and they were a juggernaut. So I've got Easy like days. 100 people in the stands. And if like there's any advice I wish I, you know, could present to that 19 year old kid was like, of course, I was nervous for the game. I'd never played the National Hockey League t that day. You know, I was playing against uh, somebody uh, up, up to that point. I'd never played in the NHL. Um, but I was more stressed about the fact that I was stressed than I was initially. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, I don't know what fairy tale I thought that I would just totally show up to my first game like I had played a thousand. Um, but I was more stressed that I was like not getting the stress out of me. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't, you know, now as, as I've gotten older, you know, very similar, the NHL schedule, you're playing 82 games. You've got a, a long preseason prior to, you're hoping to play an additional possible 28 games, you know, as you go through the Stanley cup finals. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that used to stress me out a lot when I was younger was I get on the ice for warm up, and oh, I don't have my, I don't have my legs tonight. I feel tired. Yeah. And now that, you know, I'm five, six, seven, whatever years in, in I, uh, I don't feel it anymore. I've played plenty of game where I feel tired in the first, you know, five minutes of warm up. I've played plenty of game sick where I don't feel well or injured. Um, and I think when I stopped stressing about the fact that I was stressed was when I realized like, this is normal. You're doing something that you care about. And 
I would never want to not do something I care about. You know, like I would, I'd rather do something I love. Do you, do you find now, like when you go like, you know, let's, one day you'll be playing hockey again because the, the lights will come on. Um, Ain't but, that the truth? Uh, do you find now, do you still have stress at the beginning of a season? Like the first, like first couple of games? Like, the first game for sure. Yeah. The first regular season game for sure. Even the first preseason game. Um, thinking back, like even in this particularly, uh, this past season with the Devils, we had a tough season, uh, but we had this excruciating training camp. I mean, it was... I've been through some tough training camps, uh, but it was just the consistency of it. We would have, you know, an hour, hour 20 long uh, pregame skate. You know, in preseason, you fly. If it's a road game, you'd fly to the road game, you know, two, three hours, uh, play the game that night, fly back, get home. You know, it's one, two in the morning, come back 10 a.m. the next day and back on the ice for for two and a half hours of, you know, battle drills and things like that. Um, You know, and, and still, so... I would say for some of the beginning, be, beginning of the season, if there's ever like an outdoor game, I was lucky enough to play an outdoor game. My time as a Toronto Maple Leaf, that was, you know, kind of nerve wracking just because it's different. Like the, you're not used to your surroundings as much. Yeah. You know, I, I, I actually do want to talk about that with, you know, your Olympic experience, just kind of how you mentor now uh, and, and how you went through it the first time, like how you, you've rode, you know, now for years and years, you know, prior to your first Olympics. But there's something about events that big. Like you hear about it uh, from people that play in a Super Bowl. You know, it's just, it's a different game. You hear about it in a Stanley Cup final where the stakes are different. Totally. Um, But yeah, I'd say I've, I've gotten much better at it now. Uh, but, but isn't, isn't that weird though, that you're actually more nervous for a game at the beginning of the season than you are the last game, the most important game. Absolutely. I find, so at the Olympics, um, I'm, I'm more nervous for the heat that in, in rowing, um, you, you can't get knocked out with one bad race. You, if, if I do badly in the heat, I'm going to go to, it's called the repechage. Um, so it's, Sounds horrible. Fish- sounds like a horror. <laughs> sounds well, like purgatory or something. <laughs> it's it it actually translates to fish again. Um, but uh, that's funny. So if if you don't um, if you have a bad heat, you can go to the repechage, and then you 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 know you can get into the semifinal and progress to the final that way. So the heat really should be your like like okay, I can this is I I can screw up here and I'm I'm still good to go. Um, but it's the usually when you get to the heat, you haven't raced for a couple of weeks. Like you've been recovering from that Lucerne Mm -hmm. world cup. And there's often maybe three and sometimes even five weeks from uh, when you race in Lucerne to when you're going to go and race. And like, I think I've been training a lot, but what has my competitors been doing? And maybe I got slower in that time, like between racing, I haven't raced for a long time. It's going to be 220 strokes. Can I still do 220 strokes? And, and you know, but, you know, I would imagine when you're doing those, those 80 plus games in the season, it's, it's just such like you, you get into the routine of it, right? Like versus like, whoa, I haven't done this for a while. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's funny, right? Like how, how our, our minds, they, they put way more importance on what we haven't normalized yet, right? If you've normalized the experience, then you're like, good. So, so now you've, you've been playing for a number of years and you can like, okay, you can normalize. Okay, I, I don't need to feel perfect every day before every game because I know I'm going to shake it off. And 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 you, I, you would also know. And and this is the other thing you have to realize is that we're all going to have, you know, we all have good days, but we also have bad days, and we all ha- also have great days. And you know that at your level, your bad days are still really good, right? Like y- you will know you're playing shitty, um, but your bad days are still really good and that's why you know your teams have picked you and and that's that's the thing you've got to you you train hard enough so that your bad days are um still better than other people's good days and even furthermore i would say even that's something i've learned now as a more experienced player versus as a young pro um i would maybe get flustered okay you know let's say i get out to warm up i don't feel it but now the first period's going and i really don't feel it like i am zonked um there's a different way you play there are There's a C plus game, a C and a C minus. Totally. There's a big difference between a C minus game and a C. So you learn to um, play within your means. You know, if, if you've got the juice that night, you know, there's not a rush in sight that you don't want to join. You've got the legs. You're super excited to jump up ice. Yeah. 
uh, try and, you know, be the, I'm a defenseman, so be the, you know, fourth person in the rush, call for a puck, shoot and score. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if, if, if it's an off night, maybe you go for a line change on that, you know, rush and, yeah. and let somebody else, somebody else get out there. Yeah. But you, you know, your role, right. You yep. know, your role. So you're, you're going to do that. You, and you know, which tools you have that night to use to make sure you're, you're, you're getting the job done. Right. And that's, you know, it's always going to be the same thing. And, and like, so in, in rowing, you know, if it, it there's, we, we don't really have marquee athletes. Like it's, there's no like, Oh, in that eight, that's the person making the eight really, really move. Like it just, it doesn't work that way. We're all, it's, it's an individual task, but it's done, um, together. It's done in unison. Um, and it's, it really is one of those things where, uh, the slowest person's good. You, you, you can only go that as fast as the slowest person. And then, but the better people can pull that person up you you can't just expect them to catch up you mm-hmm. can sort of come down and bring them with you almost i guess the analogy that just weirdly popped into my brain is um geese flying right so if mm-hmm. they fly in a v formation so that they can all come along and they're they're drafting off of each other and and so we can do that um but you you just have to realize where you are that day like which i like are you going to be up at the front or are you you back in the the uh, now i'm like cycling are you back in the peloton on that day <laughs> well i want to i've never rode a day in my life but i've i've seen i think i saw when i was up in ann arbor i was playing for team usa at the time and i think i saw i don't know if university of michigan has a team i want to say yep. it was them rowing i didn't want to yep. make a fool of myself but it is such a you know they're working like banshees to make to get this thing going, but there is such a beautiful rhythm and the flow through the water. And you were talking about uh, water feel and, and the lack of chaos and how awesome it is to race in Lucerne. Like, what is I'm going to ask you to do like the impossible, which is describe like how what does it feel like when you're in that flow state with your teammates? Like, what is that? Because so so I'll go first while you think. Because in hockey, I don't know. There's just uh, there's this, there's minimal thought. There is this quickness to feel and the green light. It's almost like you see it before it goes off. If you're at a stoplight, like you, you can time it when you know it's going to come. Mm-hmm. And there's just such clarity in all of your decisions. Uh, there is this element of slowing down. Um, you know, there's this element of I'll get through the game and almost not even you know, I've, I've experienced flow state both ways where I remember every single play exactly like I saw the guy stick lane there. So I knew that wasn't open and I tried the back door and I've also had it where I don't remember a single thing, like total blackout. I was in the moment and lost it. Yeah. Um, I can't hear the music a lot of times. Like I, I'll, you know, after a warm ups or, you know, even in between periods, I totally forget there's even uh, music playing, uh, any hits, like you just it's like going through a saloon door. You just blow right through the guy and, you know, yeah, um, I don't beautiful. have too many of those. I'm physical, but not, you know, I'm not a Scott Stevens type, but so what is like flow state and high performance in rowing? What does that feel like with you and your teammates? Well, it's, it's funny, right? Because f- for your sport, so many people have played hockey or, you know, or, or skated that they can go, Oh, like, I can, or, or even, they run around, they do st- stick hockey. And, and so they have the sense and, and my sport, most people, you know, that they, they have never seen it in person or, or when you see it on TV, like everything TV makes it look easy. So TV, it just looks like this beautiful flowing sport. And everyone's like, Oh, your arms must be so strong. And I'm like, no, well, rowing is actually probably 65% legs. And because my legs and my butt are my bigger muscles, I'm going to really take advantage of those. So most of the actions going on in my legs. And so I'm going to break it down to flow kind of starting on the other side. So uh, like an Olympic style rowing race, when I was rowing an Olympic race, it's 2000 meters and in the women's pair. So I'll go with that one, which is the boat I raced in 92. That takes me about seven minutes. Um, for seven minutes, my heart rate's going to be about 204 beats per minute. Are you um, serious? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I want to, I, I have one experience in my life with, and I'll, I, with 204 beats per minute. And that is, I was with the Toronto Maple Leafs and we would do this Bruce protocol, uh, treadmill test. So it would, yeah. you'd be hooked up to all these wires and, and, uh, you had to get over 
can't remember if it was like 16. I think it was over 16 minutes. I ended up getting 18 something. And Lou Lamarillo, it was kind of his test. He's this old school, you know, GM who, yeah. you know, can be intimidating. And there was no way around it. You had to go through this brutal, exhaustive treadmill test. And I mean, I'm a fish out of water. I skate. I'm not going to, you know, be an Olympian runner anytime. But I remember based on like what they mac- they calculated what my heart rate should be, right? So it'd yeah. be like, you know, max heart rate. I'm staring at this little medical like computer screen. And then towards the end of the test, I'm seeing, I think I lasted like maybe 30 seconds at most. I'd have to ask for the sheet to see it back. But all I see is in red because it was like too much of a high, too high of a percentage of my heart yeah. rate. It was like 204. And I'm sitting there running, not sitting there, but I'm running and I'm like, I'm seeing my heart rate in red. Is that good? Like that can't be good. That. <laughs> no, know? yeah. And but, you don't want to see that. Like oh. I, I've been doing, okay, so now I will bring me back to flow later, but I've been doing it. Um, once I was doing an ERG test and I had to submit it. So this was a, a 20 minute test and I was just doing it at a, a club downtown. And I was like, I don't know what I was thinking. And I, I thought I would just crack it off and do it. And I put my heart rate monitor. It was like a big thing and I had it on my rowing handle. So I was going to be able to see it every stroke. And this particular test was going to, that one was going to take me, the one I was doing that day was going to take me 20 minutes and four minutes into it. I was already at 196 beats. And I was just like, nah, I'm done today. Like, this is so stupid putting the heart rate monitor on in front of me. You just don't want to know you're working out that yep. hard. So I actually stopped and I was like, you know, I'm coming back tomorrow. I'm going to be in a better mindset and I'm not looking at my heart rate monitor because I don't want to know. Um, but the scientists, they do measure us and they, they'll they they'll record us when we're doing um, our ERG tests that are our seven minute ERG tests and when I'm on the water. So I know, I know my heart rate is at 204 beats for the, the seven minute race, the 2000 meter race. And it gets there quite quickly um, because rowing is like, we, uh, we generally divide the race into four uh, sections for four, 500 meters, like first 500,000, which is halfway. And, and it's important to us how we're doing. So we, we generally uh, sprint to get the boat going to the first 500. And then you're, 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 pace might come down so it's like your highest speed in the first 500 to establish a lead and then you have the body pace which is a little lower and then you bring it up again and you you sprint like you know with everything you've got to the finish and now it's just like faster and faster and faster how can you go but so there's this explosion going on and your your arms and your legs and your your glutes are are prying away at like the water they're connected and you're prying every time and um when i was doing commentary i actually calculated uh, like a min's eight is lifting the equivalent of eight, 11 cases of beer every stroke and they're going 40 times a minute so if you think of having 11 they, they have a leverage <laughs> advantage but 11 cases of beer 40 times a minute and they'll go for five minutes and 20 seconds like there's this huge load it's it's so there's you know, this idea of rowing is like, oh, it's so pretty. And they're just gliding like little water spiders over the water. But what's actually going on between how we, we connect and we, it's so funny because I, I like seeing when my, my arm like goes in there, like this is my, like the blade goes into the water. But um, so the, the blade goes into the water, you connect, you lift the boat, you, you, you throw it away. And then you have to like sneak, like you have to, so my body then has to be totally recovered and like the boat can't know because oh, I don't, I'm not even describing myself. So I, when I, I take the stroke, I'm throwing my body in the direction that I want to go. So I, I, I connect to the water, I push the water behind me and I'm going backwards because rowers mm. uh, go backwards, right? So I, I, I'm throwing my body weight this way and that's the direction I want to go. But then I have to reset. So now I have to bring my body weight back this way but if I just, if I'm just mindless about it and I just toss my body weight this way, like you, you can imagine the, the, the boat's going to jerk and go in the wrong mm-hmm. direction. So now having just done this massive effort to throw my body weight this way and the water this way, I have to then be really sneaky and just kind of glide. And that's where you, what you see from the rowers is they can't disrupt the flow and the momentum that they've created going in re- you know, in our reverse. So then you have to see this calm reset, right? Where we have to reach out, reach out, reach out, and then have this explosion all over again. And while you're doing that, you have to do it with other people. So in, in, and you have to balance the boat. So 
while I'm rowing, this is a long answer to flow, but rowing is complicated. Like I was once told there's 185 things you can do wrong in every stroke. And as I got rowing, I was like, well, that's not accurate. There's way more. But, um, <laughs> so while I'm doing this power application, I'm also having to worry about the balance. And in a pair, like I'm rowing starboard side, so my blade's going out the starboard side and Kathleen's blade's going out the port side. Now, if, if you think of a tightrope walker who's walking along and they, they've got the pole, right? So they're, mm-hmm. they're balancing the pole. So in, in my boat, I only have half the pole, right? And, and I'm tied, let's say I'm tied at my waist to Kathleen, who's got the other half of the pole. So now, now we're doing this massive explosion and we're having to like have this balance, uh, like balance dance where I've got one side, she's got the other side. I, ca- I cannot balance the boat by myself. I cannot half balance the boat. I have to have a coordinated balance at every moment with Kathleen. And so the crazy thing about flow and rowing is when you get there, it's all so easy. And you're just, it's so easy to apply that force. And you don't even think about the fact that you're just gasping for air as you're, as you're floating forward to take another stroke. And, and as you put your blade in the water, it, you get this sensation that your boat is, is kind of like a hot knife going through butter. And it just, the water just gets out of the way and you're just moving. And, and the 500, the 1,000, the 1,500, they come faster than you would expect them to. And you cross the finish line. And at the moment you cross the finish line, flow is gone. Um, that, that sense that you your body was just in this beautiful state where everything was moving beautifully and the boat was lifting as you were exploding. That is the moment that you feel the lactic acid completely take over your body. It's like, you know, you're gasping for air, especially early races. I always think it's, we, we would call it like hot poker throat where it's like someone takes a, like a red hot poker and just rips it out of your throat and it's just like dry and you just you, your throat hurts and your lungs are on fire you're and you, you don't even know where in your body hurts the most because it is your legs and your glutes and your abs and your arms and you're just done and um you know f- flow can only a- exist when you're at maximal effort because as soon as you stop the, your your body is reminded that it is absolutely been tortured, and um, you know you will you will never ever see a rower do a victory lap. They're just collapsed and and trying not to fall out of the boat. I mean that's you did a beautiful job um, explaining, and that I was I like, hoping you I would need to drink uh, water. <laughs> yeah, ain't that yeah? I uh, I was talking to one of my other podcast guest was Zach Bitter, who's an ultra marathoner. I asked him a similar question where, you know, he does these hundred mile races, a world record holder. And he just did, he just did a 12 hour treadmill run for, uh, for charity. And I'm like, I know if, if 30 seconds at 204 heart, you know, beats per minute, that's closer to physical torture than it is flow state, you know, on a, on a treadmill for me and, and what yeah. I've trained for. So I'm, I'm glad that you tipped your cap to the beauty of your sport in a way that I really felt that. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting. I had to ask, you know, Zach, uh, better again. I'm like, Zach, how do you do the, the hundred mile? He's like, well, you know, I, I kind of toe up to the line and then I just start running and, uh, keep going. I'm like, no, no, no. We gotta, we gotta go back. There, there's yeah. no way it's yeah. that easy, man. Cause that's incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a, uh, skating test in, in Washington and this is where I just think rowing and just the adaptation to each sport is so cool. Cause I'm curious about anything from, you know, rest and recovery, how you, how you do recover, um, you know, in rowing, you know, from race to race or, you know, from the Lucerne, for example, to the next, you know, four or five weeks, uh, but we did have, uh, we had this skating test where we were with the Capitals, we had a really demanding first day and we had a player and you had to go the length of the ice and back. So it's 200 feet, length of the ice and back. And through the red line, you had a certain period of time frame to do it. You had 38 seconds to do it first, two yeah. minutes off. Then you had to beat 40 seconds, two minutes off. And then you had to do it one uh, third time. 
for 40 seconds. And then that was the end of the test. And we had a player so exhausted that the trainers literally had to pick the, pick him up off the ice. Yeah. And he was like, I'm done. There's, there's no moss. There's nothing in my legs. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, and we had to carry him off. Like he'd, you know, broken, you know, bones. Um, and that was, so really the only time we ever experienced that just cause our schedule is so exhaustive is really in training camp. We'll have every team's usually got like a test or two and there's that dreaded nature. You don't sleep all the night before. And I just imagine like, this is your sport. Like the respect yeah. that I have that this is your sport um, and what you get judged on and, and what you carry expectations with. It's nothing short of uh it's, it's a, it's a beautiful sport that I have tr- much more respect for with given your perspective. Oh, thank you. Um, but I, I think, you know, for, for sure you can't help but watch lots of hockey up in Canada and Toronto and, um, you know, seeing how long your season is and how you guys have to survive through that season. Um, you know, I, we have a lot of respect for that because we, we race so rarely, like, um, when I was rowing, uh, we got a lot of races in, I think in 92, and you're going to think this is crazy. We got 18 race starts in like 18 in, and you're like, what? I play 82 regular season games. And I'm like, no, no, like 18 was huge. And now that the, the sports scientists actually are having the athletes race a lot less, um, so that they can, um, peak for them. And, you know, I'm, probably going to get distracted again, but, uh, there was a shot putter, a Canadian shot putter, um, Dylan, Dylan Armstrong. And he, um, it was for the London Olympics, I think. And he knew like he, he was interviewed and he said he knew that he could set a world record in London if he only competed in London, but he had an opportunity to make, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in appearance fees and performance bonuses doing the diamond league and different competitions throughout the year. And so he knew, he knew like he could set a, a record um, at, at one event at the end of the year, um, or he could do it professionally and take care of his family um, and, and do lots of competitions throughout the year. Um, so it, it is this dance now with um, high performance and Olympic sport about how many competitions do you go to, um, and that's, that's the difference, right? So you guys just, um, you are a sport that is entertainment and you are, you, you have to, what you do every night. And I, I used to, I have to admit, I'm going to, I probably shouldn't. It was almost derogatory how I would say it, but, um, my practices were as hard, if not harder than your games, but it was because you 100%. had so many of them. That's not, that's right. Absolutely. It's, no question. It, it's, yeah, I, I kind of had to mature a little bit to kind of get it. It's because you had so so many of them and they're action packed. And you know, I, I should talk to you more about recovery because our recovery is we actually got to recover. Um, you know, we would have races. The the one thing that I did low. Um, so in 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 my first Olympics, so in, in Barcelona, uh, we did two events. So you know, I talked about rowing in the pair with Kathleen, but I also mm-hmm. took went with Kathleen and I rowed in an eight. Um, and then we also, in that eight, there was four other women who were also rowing a four. So there were six athletes who did two events, which meant we were racing every day when everyone else in the world had at least a day to recover. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we learned a lot about how much recovery is in your head. Um, because people always said, Oh, you need to have 24 hours, if not 48 hours, if you want to get back up to peak um, condition because of the, you know, your ATP, like all the, the the power systems in your body, right? So the ATP PC system, which is your sprint, um, and you only get to use that once every 48 hours. And that's true if you believe it. And we just decided to not believe it. We know it's true, but we just were like, you know what, I'm going to tap into it. And, um, you know, in the, in the same way you were saying that some games you have to figure out how to use different tools and how you feel on that day. Sometimes we're tired. And so we just had to be smarter and dig deeper. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how, you know, what we did and, and, and how we did it is, um, was designed to, uh, win at the world, win, win one day at the world championships and, and, what you 
do is designed to win through a season to get you to an exhaustive playoff series. So it's, 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 it's different. And, and the other thing, I, yeah, I, here I am. I, I, I have a kinesiology degree, so I, I can't help but like coming in and saying, so when you did your test and you got to 204 beats per minute, that was also at the end of a long, um, yep. like slope up and, and they've done studies on perception of exertion. And if, if you're going in and out, of exertion, like in the same way you do shifts, if you're going in and out of exertion, it will feel way harder than if you're just like, what I do is just get up and plateau and hold it because your brain doesn't have this idea of on and off. It only knows on. So it, it doesn't have any like, oh, I remember what off is. I, mean, I forget what off is. And when you're going in and out and in and out and in and out, your brain is very aware of like, I was just off a second ago and now you want me to be on again but off was really nice and you know the lactic acid is also um a wave kind of behind you so the way we build up lactic acid you know it's it's following you so it's you know your your teammate who was like a puddle on the ground he was going into a point where all the mitochondria in his his body were just so full of lactic acid he's telling him to go and they're like no i don't I don't know. You probably wouldn't have minded if I flipped you the bird there, but that's what I was thinking. But no, I love it. And I, I think it's so you you were talking about the story where you could see your heart rate. Yeah. And how mentally, you know, and now you're discussing like I just simply didn't accept the science. My mind was not gonna run on a 48 hour cycle because I had to race yeah. every 24. In the NHL, after 82 games and a month long training camp, you know, four to eight games, however many you play. That first playoff game, the energy is through the roof. Yeah. And I think it shows to, you know, the mental um, fortitude. And, you know, if you believe you're tired, you will be. Um, if you, you know, are certain that there's more in the tank, there is. And I yeah. think that, you know, if I had to say, you know, just with the travel schedule and the amount of games... I don't, I wonder what most players, if you were to ask them like, okay, how many games do you have your A game? You know, uh, like where you just get out to warm up and you feel fantastic. Maybe it's 20 games. Maybe it's half for some guys. Yeah. Uh, but I am also willing to bet it doesn't correlate with all their best performances. Um, and that's a weird space to be in. Cause you always, you obviously chase recovery. You do everything you can, yeah. but it's There's not, you know, the, always the, the only factor. There's a, um, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's, a, it's based on competence. And so the, the lower your level of competence, the more, the, the better you think you are, right? So if you- <laughs> Sounds like my golf no, game. <laughs> no, but it's, right. And the higher your level of competence- the worse you think you are, right? So if you asked Stephen Hawking what he knew about the universe, he would say, I know nothing, right? Like the, the person who knew, they would like the smartest brain we've had since Einstein, right? Spear, yeah. Like if you asked him what he knew about the universe, he would say, I know nothing because what he knows is the universe is unknowable, right? And then you take someone who is not Stephen Hawking and you say, what do you know about the universe? And he was like, oh, you know what? I know there's the Big Dipper and I know there's like Orion <laughs> and there's the Milky Way. Like what else is there to know kind of thing? And like, it's, it's that whole thing. Like the more, the more you know, the more critical you are of yourself because you know more. And it's, it's like, you know, that, that whole thing where it's, you ask somebody how many, you ask a great player, how many A games they had, they'll probably give you a really low number. You ask a shitty player, how many A games they had, they'll probably give you a really high number. <laughs> right. Cause they're just too shitty to know they're shitty. Yep. Um, and, uh, uh, anyways, so I always think the Dunning Kruger is funny, but, um, I, I think for me, one of the, yeah. Do you ever have these, these uh, like moments where you realize that something that happened to you early in your career was a gift that you just like, that, that changed the course of, of my, whether it's something physical or mental, but I had a, yes. a teammate, um, a girl who was trying out, uh, 
for the the national team, the, when I was first trying out for the senior team, um, uh, Marilyn um, Marilyn Rochon was uh, trying out for the team with me, and she was a master's student at McGill in sports psychology, and she told me that her thesis was all about um, <laughs> lying. So the rowers, it was, she was using rowers, and and so there's the the tests. 10, 10 athletes come in and she says, do, do your best. And they, they, they're honest with them. And those athletes get very close to their personal best. And another 10 athletes come in and they lie to them. Like they take away all of the feedback. And when they think they're going um, fast, she would say, no, you're going slow. Like during the test. And they would always lie to them, like, you know, give them a, a performance that was a little slower than they were going. And that whole group uh, got personal bests, like like blew it out of the ballpark. And then the third group comes in and they lied to them the, the other way. So when they um, they thought they were going, uh, they they were, they thought they were going good. They were going, oh, you're going great! This is amazing! Like you're like on pace for a world record kind of thing. That whole group slowed down, right? Wow. Where where the goal was That's to get as great to get as great a test as possible, right? It wasn't to get a certain score. It was to do as well as possible. And what she was able to tell me at that time was that our, our brain will limit us. So that last group didn't think they were capable of being great. And so they're like, they dumbed it down a little bit. So, cause they thought they were, were good. And they're so they were going for who they thought they were, was as good. And the, the other test, the middle group that I talked about, they thought they were good. They didn't think they were bad. And so when they were being told they were bad, they're like, oh my God, I'm at least good. And so they pulled it up. And what they did was they actually pushed themselves up to great. And and so for me, that's one of those mind games where you, I, our mind will always try to limit what our body can do. So we, we should, at whenever possible, get out of the way of of like, you know, do as much as you can technically, but so for the heart rate, like don't limit yourself, right? Like maybe my heart rate is going to be 196. And I later learned that my racing heart rate was 204, but I don't need to know that at the moment because that's for great people. And I needed to think that I was good <laughs> and you know, my results could be great, but I had to kind of think that I was in the, 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 the human being category as I was doing them. You know, there was a quote on your mentorship, uh, part of your website where it said you will never be qualified to know your own limits. Yeah. Right. And I thought that was profound and, and very related to what you were talking about. And, uh, yeah, I've definitely had moments in my career that at the time felt like difficulties and felt like adversity, or I wasn't happy with the way a coach was relaying a message, or I wasn't happy with the way I felt and long term have been great sources of inspiration and growth and, and real change. Um, yeah. and, uh, it, it is funny the way the brain works that way. And it's like, nothing is punished like competence, you know, is a, is a yeah. comment that, uh, you know, my trainer will use, um, from time to time and we kind of joke about it, but <laughs> like, especially in your sport, like the punishment is the reward, the, the self, you know, uh, what you can endure is the reward yeah. of doing your best. It's, it's uh, but, but it, you know, the, the number of shifts you must have come off going, I can't do another shift. And then you do, right? All you, just all you need is a power that. play. And all of a sudden you're right? excited to get back. Yeah. Yeah. Coach, I'm fresh. You hide your deep breath. You're like, no, I'm good. You know, get me right? out there. And, and you just realize that you're so absolutely completely done. And then, you know, you did another and then you did another. And that's, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called The Power of More. And that's, mm -hmm. it's all about that. It's all about that. You know, I don't have to worry about being able to do 10 steps. I just have to do one. And if I do 10, one steps, then I've, I've done the 10 steps, right? So it's, there's always these little steps and the, uh, the, the way they add up, um, you know, just if I just focus on doing that a little bit more or whatever, and, and it, it comes from that. It comes from, you know, I set, you know, I think I want to set a limit or I, I have an idea of what perfect is. And as soon as I get there, I'm like, well, I can do that more. I could do that better. Or I could do this. And so like that perfect is a myth. And as soon as you get there, you realize that you can, you can, you know, as soon as you achieve what you thought was perfect, you will realize that it's not even close. 
So over the course of your career, you know, you're part of the 92 Olympics in Barcelona, part of the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. Um, you know, what was really a highlight that was a stepping stone for you? So what was a moment where you knew you had done your best at that point, but there was a whole nother level here that you could get to? Um, it's, you know, it, it seems today I, I seem to be talking about formative parts of my career because sometimes I, I talk way more about 96. Uh, 96 was very complicated. The expectation on Kathleen and I to repeat our medals, like that's, that's kind of a, a different, um, sometimes, some days I, you know, I, I would have kept us completely in 95 and 96, but I, I, I feel that I'm more in Barcelona, which is 92. We had a, um, a training camp in Switzerland and we were on this lake in the middle of nowhere and Kathleen and I went out and did, um, a row and it was, it was just drills. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't heart rate. You know, our, I doubt our heart rate got to 145 and, mm. you know, it was just something out there we were doing and it was all about balancing. It was all about coordinating and it was all about, um, moving the boat and being balanced and, and the boat, um, a boat, a boat is like a bike in, in that, when you go slower, it's, it's harder to balance. And if you've ever tried to be on your bike and not put your feet down when you get to a stop sign, you know, you're like, yeah, good how, do, how do those guys do it? You know, like be on the stop sign and they just stand here like perfectly still. Um, rowing's the same. The slower you go, the balance gets harder. And we decided on this one day that we were going to do a drill. We were going to do 2,000 meters, which at race pace would take us seven minutes. And at the pace we did, it took us more like 11. Um, and we did, instead of rowing at 24, which would be a normal training pace and racing, it'd be more like 38. But we took the stroke rate down to 10. And we knew that because the 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 counter, the stroke rate counter we have would actually turn off when you go below 10. It was like you know, when you're sitting in a room and you're not moving enough and the lights turn off because there's mm -hmm. not enough motion detector on you. So we took it, we actually took it below 10 and we rode 2000 meters. Um, and instead of bringing our water, our blade out of the water and feathering it so you can come over the water easily, we made it hard and we went square blade. And so we did 2000 meters, 10 strokes a minute, square blade, and we didn't tick the water. And it was mentally... Uh, just it's extraordinarily exhausting to go that slowly for that long. Um, and when Kathleen and I finished it, and usually I'm really chatty and I'm always like kind of, I'm a bit of a sergeant at arms in the role. Like I'm like, oh, like let's do this. We always have to be doing this. I was like, oh my God, we can just crawl home now. That was amazing. And I think that workout, being able to do what we were doing so slowly at that technical level we knew the sky was the limit. You know, I just knew, cause we don't, we don't, for that 11 minutes, we don't talk. We're like, Oh, a little over here, a little over that there. And you know, she's steering and, uh, cause she, she steers with her foot just like kind of little do it. But if she steers too much, the boat's going to tilt over. There's wind going through. There's like waves coming from a boat on the other side of the lake. Um, and it was this silent focused 11 minutes of complete commitment to the process. And it was just, we are so on the same page. We are so connected technically. Um, I will forever remember that workout as the one was just like that workout told me that special things were going to happen. Um, and I, I actually can't even remember if that one preceded that Lucerne race, I think it may have come after the Lucerne race, but before the Olympics. And I just, you know, we went, we, we, we weren't beaten. Nobody, nobody beat us after that row. That's awesome. I mean, just your respect for the process and engaging in something that's slow. Um, and yeah. that's that fundamental. I think uh, that's something I've always tried to study, you know, in other sports, whether you hear about, you know, Kobe Bryant's work ethic and his commitment to, you know, the fundamentals, right. the Jordan, the Jordan documentary, you know, front and center, um, you know, talking about how you could see it, just how playing strength, conditioning improvements, you know, the improvement it had in his game against, uh, you know, the Detroit, you know, Pistons and things like that. And it's interesting, you know, as a hockey player, you 
I have, I'm an independent contractor, right? Like Connor Carrick's trying to be the best player that I can be. And I have, you know, goals and dreams, um, you know, that all coincide with making uh, the team better, but our team practice is normally very team focused, you know? And, you know, one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is you have to, as a professional, like remit, it is my, I am responsible for my development. It is, I have to answer to the team and work on breakouts and, uh, you know, four on four play or my gap control, whatever. But it's also my job to like independently work on uh, my sifters from the point so that the shot is consistently tippable. I have to, you know, independently on my own, make sure I'm, you know, eating and sleeping, things like that. And I think, you know, respecting that process, like you don't know, you just have to show up and do the work every day. Like that's, I, I'll, I'm willing to bet that you did not know how transformative that workout was going to be beforehand. Mm-mm. It but was just, just a workout. It was it was just something hard I came up with. Like, let's try this today. It's awesome. But you show up and all of a sudden, you know, you learn something that, yeah. you know. But I, I, I like, what, you know, where you're going. No one's going to push you up onto a podium, right? Like you you are responsible for someone someone might point out a ladder someone might say that's the rung on the ladder but you're the you're the one who's responsible for climbing the ladder how do you so how do you transition cuz eventually you do go to uh the 2000 Olympics in Sydney and have to retire yeah which isn't fun well hopefully a gift, you know, we can, we can talk about in a positive light, but I just know at that point, it's something that every athlete fears, but knows is coming that that day is uh, on its way and getting closer by the day. Um, You know, how have you transitioned from, you know, sport to what you do now uh, mentoring with, you know, team Canada Olympics um, and being the ambassador that you are, you know, for what you're interested in now? Well, you know, so I was pretty much at the Sydney Olympics um, when I had two discs rupture in my back and I, I needed to stay in that environment for um, uh, physio and to be taken care of and everything like that. Um, and it ended up being a blessing because I'd always been, you know, my previous two games, uh, first week I'm rowing, I'm very focused and I do my thing. And the second week I'm out like celebrating and I'm very focused on that. And I really kind of didn't get a sense of what all the other athletes were going through. And so there I am in Sydney and I can't really move around so much. I'm lying down and I'm talking with the athletes, you know, it, you know, I, I, you know, I had a chance to sit and like Steve Nash is on that team and he comes mm-hmm. and I'll have a coffee with me because I'm just literally lying on the grass beside a coffee little cart and I would just talk with people as they came by. And, and that sort of really opened my eyes up to the community that was the Olympic team. And then before, and then, you know, time passes and I'm like running around, like doing sponsorship and speaking and stuff like that from 2000 to 2000 and, um, no, yeah, from 2000 to 2005, um, that I get asked to go and speak in front of a bunch of athletes, the winter athletes who are going to go to the, the turn games in 2006. Um, and I go and I, and I talk about, you know, a lot of things that we're talking about here, like just, you know, fears and doubts are normal and, um, you know, normal people will do special things and, you know, volume control on, 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 um, you know, like your fear and doubt and just kind of turn up the like goodness, like here and why not you? And it ended up being so well received that something like, uh, 14 of the 16 sports asked me to then come also into their training camps and talk to them. Um, and so with the Canadian Olympic committee, we decided that we needed to start creating a mentoring space. Um, in Canada, we had recently won the bid for the Vancouver games and we were creating something called own the podium, which was going to be more than a funding. We knew, we knew that, um, because we'd hosted Canada had hosted the games twice and won no medals that Canadians were going to have a really tough time paying the bill if we didn't have a better Olympics. And so we had to create something that was going to help Canadian athletes do well. And so we're putting all this money into the science and technology and coaching. And um, I was brought in and I started creating a a mentorship space for athletes. So going in and and talking to athletes and bringing in other um, Canadian athletes, um, you know, my Olympic uh, peers to come in and tell their story. And there is not a single story of anyone who ends up on the top of the podium who had a straight path to get to it. And, but everyone thinks it's easy. Like, oh, they started their sport. They did this. They won. They got there. And when you start hearing about the personal uh, 
drama and trauma, the uh, political unrest within a team, with a coach, with uh, a, a sport organization, and everyone starts realizing, like sort of normalizing this path. Um, you know, the 2006, I, I ended up mentoring a winter team. Like, what do I know about winter sports? I'm a rower. Like I sit on my ass, I go backwards all day long. Um, and it, was, it had a really positive result. And so then I became staff with the Canadian Olympic Committee for the 2008 games in Beijing. Uh, Vancouver was an incredible experience to be uh, a specialist in Olympic prep and mentoring um, for a host games. Um, I did the same for London um, and then for Sochi and then uh, for Rio, actually, I stepped out. My, my wife and I uh, had a family. And so I, I stepped away from the Rio That's games. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've come back in uh, and, and I, I felt when I was applying to be the chef de mission for the Tokyo 2020 team, like how, how could anyone have been better prepared? <laughs> really? Like, I, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to succeed on the Olympic stage. I know what it's like to have my ri heart ripped out when I, I can't compete, you know, even like with respect, like the, it's, it can't, you can't compare to what's going on right now because no one's ever gone through a pandemic, but you know, I, I had a bomb go off the night before uh, a race in Atlanta like there's so much chaos around Olympic performance and sport performance um, that I think you know going into Tokyo uh, when we get there it'll be my 10th Olympic environment and I've done like Pan Am games as well um, you know I, I just love learning from all the different sport cultures and all the different athletes and hearing um their approach to things like I, I went around softball and I was working with softball baseball for the the Beijing games and I went into their training camp and all they did was talk about failure. I was like, failure? Like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to talk to you guys about failure. Like, stop talking about failure so much. But then they explained to me they're a sport that they, they make mistakes so many times they keep, you know, stats on errors. And, you know, th they're pointing out to me that they have to, that everything's coming at them so quickly. So a pitcher, if they if they throw something that gets hit or, you know, a run, they have to let go of that so quickly because if they're still focused on their failure from the last pitch, they're going to make a mistake on the next pitch. And it's the same for the batter. The batters have to realize that it's, you know, and they know this, it's not their job to get on base. It's their job to advance the, the runner. And so you might end up taking a worse stat on your own personal thing. Like it's, so when they explain to me the importance of, addressing failures for the purpose of moving through them. I'm like, oh, that is so cool. Like I, I you know, I, I had underestimated softball. I thought as a rower, you know, we're so tough that what could I learn from softball? And I've, I've learned something from every sport that I've ever worked with. Yeah. Even as we, uh, you know, when our season first paused and we're kind of unsure, still unsure about when we're going to play again, but I was talking with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kendall Coyne, Schofield, uh, U.S. Olympian for women's ice hockey. Yeah, fabulous. And we were talking, um, and I'm like, you know, it's really interesting, you know, training with kind of like an abstract start date out there, you know, for an extended period of time that I'm not normally used to. And she's like, you know, yeah, like imagine all the Olympians out there that, you know, train for something that's yep. four years out. And it really, I really do think that spending time with athletes of other disciplines has been a great learning experience for me, you know. Yeah. Um, Cool. You know, even conversations like this and, you know, with Kendall and uh, Zach Bitter, it's been something I've been super grateful to do. I'm also glad that you said uh, Chef de Michon because I did not know how to say that <laughs> say that word and how you were going to represent Su at Sushi the point. Chef. So I was like, yeah. oh, I'm just going to wait for uh, Marnie to go with that one. Um, I, I mean, uh, help me with the discussion too where um, the Olympics, the summer games, I understand, are on – pause and I think you were involved with that process? Oh, um, well, I was part of the discussion that Canada had, Team Canada had, um, when we just sort of, uh, we, we took, we took the first moment where we realized the, the IO, the IOC had said that they were considering a postponement, but they would get back to us in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we just knew that, uh, the safest and best thing to do for the Canadian athletes was to say that that wasn't 
um, appropriate for us because what the athletes would have been doing in those two weeks was figuring out how to train for the possibility of an Olympics. Um, and so with our athletes commission and uh, senior leadership at the Canadian Olympic Committee, we made a decision that we weren't going to wait the two weeks for the, CO- for the IOC to come back and say um, the games are postponed. We just said, you know what, Canada's not going to go in July of 2020. Um, and we look forward to going to the Tokyo Olympics when they're safe. So we, we never said we wouldn't go to the Olympics. We just said July 2020 was, um, wasn't going to be a safe time. And that's, you know, we all know that right now it's not even close. So, yeah. Yeah, adding to your resume of experiences to draw on in the, in the future, you know, that make you even more qualified further to mentor. Well, I, you know, the only thing I think I brought to the conversation was just the strength of um, people want real answers. Like athletes want to know, like, what am I supposed to do today? Because if you tell me that I might have to compete, then I have to train like I am going to compete. Um, you know, there's no like, well, I might train today. And and so I was like, we need to give clear answers. And so in the conversation, we made sure that we weren't going to give an unclear answer, which, which was what, um, ended up being Canada being the first country to, to make that decision. I think Australia followed, um, within about six hours, even, I don't know if they heard us. It was like, Oh yeah, us too. Or that was just the timing of their, their release came out just a little bit after, but, but you know, it's hard. I just want to, it's Olympic athletes and, and, um, you're probably the same athletes at this level. We're not actually very good at working out. You know, we're really good at training for stuff. Um, working out is, isn't is what we do. It feels and empty. So that's, that's, yeah, right? Like, so when there's no purpose and goal, um, it, it seems really hard. So I think that's the thing for the last couple of months that's been so um, mentally draining on, on athletes around the world. How, how have, have you been in contact with a lot of the Canadian athletes trying to help them through, you know, kind of the next step? Uh, you know, uh, with with some, but I, I won't overstate um, the conversations I've been having mm-hmm. with them and the importance, um, the con- connection I have with them. Um, the conversations where they're going to be talking about their mental health is going to be with their specific and, and team specific mental performance consultants and their coaches and their their teammates. And I, I'm 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 privy to listening to those conversations with them. But uh, for many of the athletes, the relationship that I was going to build up with them should have been happening in the last five months. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in Toronto and they're all over Canada. Interesting. One other, uh, I guess one final sort of topic I wanted to talk about um, is you are a major advocate in the Canadian sport community as an LGBTQ plus ambassador. And in the NHL, uh, I don't know if we have um, an openly gay hockey player yet that I know of. No, you don't. Uh, we do not. And we Which do isn't have to say there play. isn't a gay player in there. They're just not openly gay. I was on a wonderful conversation just the other day with uh, Georges Laroque, a, a great um, ally from the NHL. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, you you we ha- you have wonderful allies from the NHL um, for the LGBT community. But well, and I I, so I, f- I do know we have the you can play you know initiative. Um, yeah. But I, I just want to I don't know I guess have a conversation around. You know I'm a player in the league. Um, how can we continue to facilitate more inclusiveness in our sport from someone you're not a part of hockey? Um, yeah. but you know, I do think, uh, you have insight on, you know, the culture of our sport that would help us, uh, be more inclusive in a way that, yeah. you know, I, I don't share your perspective. I don't know. Yeah. Well, language is everything, Connor, like, you know, people who are trying to figure out if, whether it's the locker room or the, 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 out of the bar with a team where when people are listening constantly to find out what's a safe space and we're listening to language and, you know, off color jokes where you think, you, you know, if, if you're just thinking no one in the room, it's, it's, it's just a funny joke. Right. And it's a, it's derogatory. Like that person knows it's not a safe space. And even if you think you're an ally and I, you know, throw my brother a little bit under the bus on this one. My brother um, was one of the last people I came out to because he just would tell jokes and he would say things and he would talk about gay couples, uh, whether it was men or women. He would just talk about them in a way that I was like, I don't think that was really comfortable. That didn't make me feel comfortable. Um, Or, you know, if he told a joke or used some slang, um, 
it didn't make me think that my brother was a safe space. And, you know, my, my dad, who's like, my dad was a safer space, even though my dad was like, what am I supposed to say to my friends? I'm like, just tell them I'm happy. Um, my dad was a safe space and it took me a while to come out to my brother. Um, because he hadn't shown me he was going to protect me. Right. Like that, that he was going to be genuine with me. And, and so for, for allies, um, you know, the, the, the key is to kind of watch, watch your language and, and to help check other people in their language. And, you know, I'll, I'll take it into another environment. Like I do a lot of work with special Olympics Mm -hmm. and they have, um, a program that there's no, there's no, there's no good place for the R word. And so the idea of that, if someone uses the R word, I'm going to call them out and say, you know what, that's, that's not appropriate. There's a lot of other words that can, that can describe what you're saying, um, but not that one. And, uh, you know, if someone's using language about the LGBT community, uh, you can say, you know what, we can probably use other words. Like, I know, like, you might think I'm sounding kind of overprotective here and maybe you think nobody in the room cares but maybe somebody does maybe somebody's listening maybe somebody has a sibling maybe somebody in the room is gay maybe someone's brother or sister is gay and you've just made them want to not tell you any stories about their brother or sister um you know it's it's language is everything and if you use the wrong language you'll you will force someone in the LGBT community to start using default language. So with my brother, I used a lot of default language. So instead of saying my girlfriend, I said, you know, who was my partner at the time, I would say, oh, my friend. And I would sort of downplay like the relationship there and, um, you know, just words that were the genuine and correct word for me to use, I couldn't use. I just sort of defaulted everything to be really beige. Um, you know, I, I stopped asking my brother personal stories, uh, personal questions, because I didn't want him to ask me personal questions. Like, if you find someone's not telling you any personal stories, isn't that kind of weird? You you mm-hmm. clearly haven't created a space for them where they feel comfortable telling you personal stories. Um, and, and that's something to be flagging. So it's, it's always language matters. The words you're using matters. The stories and how you tell them matter. Who you stand up for matters. And you would all know this, like how, how you stand up that first time uh, someone stands up for you, you realize they've got your back. But if nobody stands up for you, you just, you just don't know what's going to happen um, in a uh, in a vulnerable situation. You know, hockey's going through, you know, and I guess society at large, you know, really in the United States, particularly we're talking, um, you know, a lot of the show, social injustices uh, that have been well covered in, in the media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hockey has had, you know, it's fair share of articles questioning our culture, whether it's, um, you know, there's been issues at the junior hockey level that have come out where people, have discussed, uh, you know, the horrors of hazing. Um, you know, Akeem Alyu, uh had an article come out about his experiences with yeah. with some coaches. And I think, you know, I uh, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of the growth of the game. You know, hockey's given me a lot, and I want to make sure that we, uh, as a sport, are inclusive and are able to to gift what I'm so fortunate to have had. And, yep. um, you know, I really do think there's really two core uh, you know, emotions at, at the human level, you're, you're either fearful or you're usually acting in love. And, uh, you know, I would hate to facilitate or contribute to an environment, um, that makes someone fearful of others, fearful of judgment. You know, that, that lack of safety, I think, uh, is something no player should have to experience. And, you know, you were very quick to, um, clarify no openly gay, um, you know, player. And, and I, I do want to, and I guess say that uh, if there was a you know player in our in our game that um, is gay and is is an uncomfortable, a lot of the uh, players and locker rooms that I've been in, we've we've talked about this that um, we would be you know very supportive and and try to have a conversation like this where 
hey man, like what what are you going through and and what's it like being you every day and and how can we help as you know guys in your room to um, help make this special time as a pro athlete or you know it could be at any other level of hockey, but I hope it's something that we see because I uh, yeah every I think every person experiences arenas of their life where they're uncomfortable with their own skin to some regard, you know and um, uh, I don't believe a person's sexuality should be one of them. I, I don't think. Yeah. It should be uh, a source of fear for athletes. And I understand where it would be, you know, just from um, insensitive commentary or jokes, you know, like you were saying, they're not funny. And, uh, you know, I appreciate your your insight and your perspective. Yeah, thanks. Marnie, this was awesome. This was, um, I think I got to the bottom of my notes here. I uh, I really enjoy the connection and and you sharing your story and, Frankly, teaching me about rowing because I knew next to nothing. <laughs> um, but I have so well, much respect for Well, if you get on a rowing machine, athlete. that is not rowing. So I, I, I'm sorry no, I, exactly. I interrupted. There's but no if you get on a rowing field, machine, yeah. that's not rowing. You, you got to get somebody out, get you out in a boat one day. But what's So what's the erg, though? Like the erg, the erg is, is, it, is the rowing machine. An, an erg is a is rowing it machine. Is it like a special one? Is it like, it's not at the Lifetime Fitness or whatever down the road. Is it like that Well, one? you might. Like if you see no. the Concept 2, it's a uh, Concept 2 is the one that's generally used by international mm. athletes. But, you know, the water rower is going to give you, you know, a great workout also. Like all the, lots of CrossFits are doing them on Concept 2s mm-hmm. now. Um, I'd love to get out like as like a team building kind of thing. I think no, that would be so great. cool. Because you think you're so like cool. so hot shit, and then you're no. like, no, no, Humbled you just get hit in the back with somebody's <laughs> yeah. oar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I really appreciate your time, um, and you know, thank you for your help today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again today. Marnie um, was exceptional. What an awesome uh, leader and person to learn from. I said that I knew uh, in the intro, but I was really astounded uh, at her ability to take us through the ins and outs of rowing, what it's like to be an Olympian. Uh, But there's three points in particular that I thought were really special. Uh, One was when Marnie was discussing the sports psychology about how our brain will limit us and the weird relationship between uh, encouragement or the need to uh, prove ourselves and and do better. Um, That's something that I really learned a lot. You know, I've, I've continued to learn a lot about myself as an athlete over the course of time. And I thought Marnie's story from, you know, her lens and, and her perspective was really interesting and kind of, uh, you know, solidified something I, th- I think I already knew. Um, second, I was really inspired when Marnie made mention about how everyone is great at something and that she was just lucky enough to find it. Um, I feel that about my own career, I had great conviction from a young age that hockey was what I wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, eventually, you know, I developed this desire to, to serve others and try to entertain and help educate myself and, and others in the process. And that is kind of what, you know, gave birth to this podcast, but I, I hope I can continue to find something else, uh, after my career and for Marnie, it seems that that's been athlete mentorship. So I'm really happy for her that, you know, in retirement, um, she's been able to, uh, move on so gracefully, uh, a great role model really for someone like myself still. Uh, currently immersed in pro sport. And a third component, I forget the uh, gentleman's name that Marnie was mentioning. I don't think she actually, did she actually say? I don't think she did. Um, Of who was exceptional, who kind of wrote the book on rowing, who was exceptional on a team basis and needed that accountability from a team. And so I challenge you, our listener, for any goal, you know, we are very linked as people. We want to do our best uh, by our common friend, by our family members. We want to make them proud of us. Uh, and if there is something that you are trying to grow at or grow in uh, your life, do your very best to either, you know, sort of create an accountability buddy or create a team around you to help you help you. And that's something that I'll be doing. I do it on the on the podcast here where, you know, uh, Colin Steingard, my producer, I want to make him proud. Uh, I try to think of, you know, our listener, I, I view us as partners that I want to do my best to be prepared for the guest um, and bring the best out of them. I am always trying to learn a little bit about the guest uh, ahead of time so I don't waste their time. It's kind of my accountability circle for the podcast. And then, of course, for, you know, pro sport, we uh, have to answer to our coaches and our teammates and things like that. Uh, I think it's a very powerful element, uh, that element of connection. So I hope those uh, points stick with you as well. 
Um, and you know, please feel free to continue to comment, um, hashtag CC pod. You can, uh, direct message me any thoughts or quotes, uh, that you love here uh, on Instagram from here on the podcast. I usually try to repost them or, or definitely try and read them. Uh, thank you for your support week in, week out. Uh, I was really proud of this podcast. I'm excited again for next week. Thank you for joining us.